places the Prophet وسلم, as the pinnacle of the example to be followed. He says, Subhanahu wa ta'ala, after A'udhu Billahi min ash-shaytan rajim لَقَدْ كَانَ لَكُمْ فِي رَسُولِ اللَّهِ أُسْوَةٌ حَسَنًا That indeed, in the Messenger of Allah. And the word fi means barfiya. So something that you submerge yourself into. al fil ina. You say the coffee is in the cup. So if you were to submerge yourself in the Messenger of Allah and go to the depths and the core of Sayyidina Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, not just the exterior, you would find someone that's worthy of adulation and imitation. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. That's why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the Quran, He swears by the exterior and the interior of the beloved Messenger of Allah. وَالنَّجَمِ إِذَا هَوَى مَا ضَلَّ صَاحِبُكُمْ وَمَا غَوَى Allah swears by the stars. We can continue to score forward, inshallah, as far as you can now, so that later on, mashallah, people can come in. And then if we can make sure to leave the area by the door open, because what happens, mashallah, there's a lot of room in the back. So when that gets blocked up, people can't step to the back. Barakallahu people. So Allah swears by the Messenger of Allah, and he likens him to a star because the star's internal consistency, its internals are combustible. It's like gas, it's hot, and it shines out. So the Prophet's internal state is, alhamdulillah, pure. And what comes out is something that is a guide in times of difficulty and hardship. Yes, alunaka anil ahila. They ask you about the celestial bodies, the times of the moons changing. You can tell them, O oh Muhammad, that these are meant for guidance and for hajj. So just as the stars in the heavens guide people through the difficulties of night, that's the Prophet ﷺ, your star, your GPS. <coughs> to take you through the difficulties of this dunya. That's uswatun hasana. The difficulties and the successes. The reason I say that is recently I was reading about what now many health organizations, the Department of Health, are declaring to be a postmodern plague, and that's loneliness. I read a study that recently said loneliness is like the third or fourth cause of premature death in this country, subhanAllah. And I meet Muslims, this is very real, who are in their 30s who aren't married. May Allah make us organized in a way that we can facilitate marriage for people. Don't tell them to get married, facilitate ways for people to responsibly meet each other and get married. And one of the things that I hear from them is like, I'm scared of being alone. When I went through a divorce, I was like 40. And one of the things that haunted me was like, I'm going to be alone. Like, it's a very difficult thing. You talk to converts who, you know, we convert in the MSA days, and that's like Counter-Strike and Hot Cheetos and Samosas and Strawberry Pop and Fobes and Cotas and Cortas. And if you're on the sister side, you have hijab parties, whatever's going down. And then everybody gets married. And you hit your 30s as a convert, and you're like, man, I committed social suicide when I converted to Islam. I don't have the cultural buffering, the raw materials that is afforded to someone who's born into a Muslim family. And you start to kind of sway and lose things. But just as the Prophet wasallam, he modeled for us the good times, he's also a star that takes us through the challenges that face the plague of postmodernity is loneliness. The word loneliness did not exist in the English language until the 19th century because in those days you had 500 people max in your village. Now most people have 500 friends they don't even know. So the parameters of urbanization and modernity, one of the outcomes of that is like loneliness. But subhanAllah, our deen is a deen which is kam, sham, alhamdulillah. 
It's a deen that is balanced and nuanced. It's very beautiful. As one of our teachers used to say, Islam is too cool for Muslims. <laughs> but we see that the Prophet Sallallahu he recognized that this balance and a very beautiful dua taught to us from Sayyidah Aisha radiallahu anha that when he would wake up before Tahajr, he would say, Allahumma Rabbi Jibra'il wa Mika'il wa Israfi. O oh Allah, the Lord of Gabriel, the Lord of Michael, and the Lord of Israfi. One of our teachers said in this dua, which is long, we won't say it all now, that the Prophet called on Gabriel because Gabriel's in charge of wahi, which is like the spiritual raw materials you need in life. He called on Mika'il because Mika'il, his job is to handle our earnings, our dunya, so that's the material raw materials. And then Israfil, وَنُفِخَ فِي سُورِ فَسَعِقَ مَنْ فِي السَّمَاوَاتِ وَمَنْ فِي الْأَرْضِ إِلَّا مَنْ شَاءَ اللَّهِ In Surah Zumar, Israfil is going to blow the trumpets that will start the hour and cause everything to die except who Allah wills. So that's the hereafter. So the Prophet calls on all three angels to show how Islam and how prophecy touches on spirituality, touches on the material, and touches on the hereafter. One of the things that the Prophet models for us is loneliness. And we believe that loneliness actually is two types. <laughs> loneliness which is looked down upon, and that's me and being like lonely that I don't have the 85 Air Jordans, I can't afford them. So I'm like down on myself. I get depressed. I've allowed myself to be commodified by the commodity. You know what I'm saying? It's like it actually is purchasing my value. And that's why the Prophet Ta'isa Abdul Dunya, cursed is the slave of dunya. <coughs> and Al Busti, the great Afghan Sufi and student of Imam Shafi'i, we're going to teach this poem in our winter retreat, inshallah, in January. He says, Ya Khadim al Jismi, kam tashqa bi khidmatihi, atatubu ribha fiha ma fiha ma fihi khusranu, aqbil ala nafs. He said, you know, you who constantly toil to serve the interest of your body, are you seeking a profit in something that is going to eventually become dilapidated? Turn to your heart and your soul and amplify its virtues because it's by your soul, not your body, that you're truly human. So the first type of loneliness which we should be careful of is lonely for ratchet stuff. That's just a simple way to say it. Stuff we know that really doesn't have any intrinsic meaning to our lives. But the second type of loneliness is the loneliness for Allah. The loneliness for the hereafter. The loneliness for our family, for things that are intrinsic to ourselves. Religion, one of the most powerful currents of religion is that it constantly and uncompromisingly demands us to recognize what we prioritize by our choices. That's what Imam Ibn Ta'ala said, إِسْتِهَادُكَ فِي مَا دُومِنَ لَكَ وَتَقْسِيرُ فِي مَا طُلِبَ مِنْكَ دَلِيلُنَ عَلَنْ تِنَاصِرْ بَسِيرَةِ مِنْكَ He said, working hard for what was guaranteed for you and neglecting what was commanded of you is the greatest sign of your short-sightedness, meaning we're not looking to be hereafter. One of the best examples of this is the Prophet ﷺ, who teaches us to long and be lonely for God, to long and be lonely for revelation, to long for his wife Khadija. You know when Sayyidah Hala radiallahu anha came to the Prophet's house in Sahih al-Bukhari, كانت تشبه Khadija. She used to be very similar. Her voice and her, 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 her look was that of Khadija. So she would come and visit the Prophet ﷺ, and she would say, Ya Muhammad, and her voice was similar to her sister. And one time she came to his house and she said, Ya Muhammad, and he started to shake and he said, Hala, Hala, because she reminded him of what's important. Sayyidah Khadija. The Prophet taught us to long for justice, to long to heal a fractured world. The Prophet taught us to long for what's important. And perhaps the best example is the statement of the Prophet ﷺ, as mentioned by the Sahaba, 
that even forbade us to live by ourselves. Meaning, of course, in New York, we keep, sometimes we have no choice but to like ostracize everyone out of my life. We have a great example of this. And perhaps one of the most vulnerable moments. Because I, myself, I tend to relate to the Prophet when he's vulnerable more than he's like Prophet Muhammad. You know what I mean? Like Prophet Muhammad, that's like at another level. Man. I can roll with the vulnerable moments really well. But many of us know that after perhaps the greatest high in his professional career as a prophet, and that was the beginning of prophecy, he experienced one of the greatest difficulties. And that was when revelation ceased. So after Iqra, and after Ya Ayyuha al-Muzammil, and Ya Ayyuha al revelation stops. And to compound his longing for revelation is then the subsequent ridicule of the people around him. So Umm al-Jamil, the wife of Abu Lahab, she used to say, Ma bika ya Muhammad, what's wrong with you, O Muhammad? Ma ra'aytu, I don't see the shaitan visiting you anymore. Some of the people around him used to say, Muhammad hada qad wadda'ahu rabbuhu wa qalah. They started to spread information that Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, his Lord has abandoned him. And his Lord despises him. So you think about the challenge of being isolated with success. And then you think about that being augmented with people who are like ridiculing you. After such a great moment in the cave, that would like really rock you. Imam Abdu'i, he teaches something very beautiful in his tafsir. And he mentions that Ibn Abbas said that this lasted for 15 days. The continued assaults of people around him, the lack of revelation. Then Sayyidina Jibreel, he came to the Prophet Such that when the Prophet saw him, he said, Ya Jibreel, ma jitta hatta shtaqattu ilayk. He said, Oh Gabriel, what's wrong? You didn't come to me till I longed for you. And he said, Wallahi, ana ashaddu shawqan ilayka, ya Rasulullah. And Jibreel, he said, by Allah, I long to see you more than you long to see me. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said to Sayyidina Rasul, Wadduha, wallayli idha saja, ma wadda'aka rabbuka wa ma qala. This chapter, this chapter of absolute hope, Allah swears by the morning light because the morning light is certain. But there's other lessons we can take quickly. And that is that oftentimes being alone is when you shine your brightest, man. I should posit loneliness in my life as something that's coming to me from the madrasa of Allah directly to me. No sheikh, no imam, no weekend course, no interference. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has allowed me to experience this for a reason that I need to uncover. It's not easy, man. But if you think about it, prophets were prepared through moments of extreme isolation. So when you see a fractured world and you hurt, or when you see things around you, people around you that are doing things that you don't agree with, and you feel that moral prick in your chest, well, at that moment, you're on the boat with Sayyidina Nuh, being ridiculed. When you see people around you, and things around you that are evil, then you're at the bottom of the well with Sayyidina Yusuf, and in jail with Sayyidina Yusuf. You're in the fire with Ibrahim. You've been ostracized like Sayyidina Nuh. And you become in the cave with Sayyidina Muhammad That's why Imam Ibn Ta'ala, he said, Adfin wujudaka fi abdil humul, fama nabata mimma lam yudfan wa lam yutimnata iju. Allah. He said, there are times that you need isolation, so dig yourself in a fertile land. 
Because what, and he says actually the word is bury. So like go in there and exercise things and then get rid of things you don't need. Like bury them. Salli alayhim al-janaza. What fin? And then bury them. And then come out resurrected through life that Allah has given you. It's very powerful what he's saying. So he said, bury yourself in a deep land because what's not planted won't grow and it won't ripen. So when Allah says, what duha, if you think about it, when you look in the sky during the time of the morning light, you don't see other stars. You can't even see the moon, although they're there. And the reason that you can't see them is that the sun, in its isolation, shines the brightest. So the Prophet ﷺ, this is a preparatory time to be alone. So instead of sometimes allowing loneliness to undermine our ability, we should take it as an opportunity for preparation. مَا وَدَّعَكَ رَبُّكَ وَمَا قَلَى Your Lord has not left you. And if you understand Arabic, it's something nice here. He doesn't say, مَا وَدَّعَكَ رَبُّكَ وَمَا قَلَى كَى He says, وَمَا قَلَى He doesn't say, your Lord hasn't left you and your Lord doesn't hate you. Because even the Prophet says, some Allah is sensitive not to trigger people. He's, he's sensitive, subhanAllah, and his rahmah, of course, but Allah, even to teach, would never say, I hate Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So the object of the verb is mahdouf. Your Lord has not abandoned you, and your Lord doesn't hate. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So alhamdulillah, loneliness is a monster. One of my teachers used to say, if loneliness was a person, the amartu bi qatli. I would order it to be slaughtered. But there is a way that we can take loneliness and try to recalibrate it and translate it into the positive. First is to reflect on the example of Sayyidina Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Number two is to recognize that being lonely for good actually is a form of ibadah. So when I see the world around me and I'm hurt by it, at least I make the intention that if I could, I would change this fractured world. I would put the cast on this fractured world. Because the Prophet says, Hamabiha. Whoever longs to do something good and can't do it, their niyyah gives them the reward of doing it. The third is to take advantage of community. So when I see events happening around me, let me step in. And I know this because I remember when I first converted and I went to a mosque, everybody spoke Punjabi, subhanAllah, in, in Urdu. And I remember... When I first went there, shaitan was trying to play with me because brothers would be laughing and sisters would be laughing. They were talking or whatever. And then shaitan was like, you know, they're laughing at you. You're that one white dude in the audience. They're laughing at you, right? White fragility like on boil. And then I said, I don't think they're laughing at me. Like I had told shaitan. So I went to his brothers like, hey man, assalamu alaikum. And we just, I stepped into a conversation. And he introduced me to Dupati and Gulab Jamun. <laughs> no. And then he took me to his house. Right? He thought I was the interfaith visitor. I was like, no, I'm Muslim, man. Not all white people are here for interfaith. <laughs> and then we watched Bollywood for like nine and a half hours. <laughs> I've never seen movies. I was like, where's the commercials? <laughs> but the point is, stepping in, it's not easy, but it makes real relationships sometimes happen to address the challenge. So I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to furnish us insha'Allah with fulfillment. As he says, Sofa Allahu min fadli. The Sahaba they were worried about losing something. Allah said, Don't worry, Allah will enrich you. Allah will take care of you. So ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala insha'Allah bil iman. Kamanas aluhu and you had be the ilayna Quran. Aqulu qawi hada astaw filullah hadi wa rakum fasta firu in the hulba for rahi. بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على أشرف الخلق الله أجمعين سيدنا رسول الله رحمة الله للعالمين وقدوة الصالحين 
Salawatullahi wa salamuhu alayhi wa ala alihi wa ashabihi ajma'in. The other thing that we can do as a community is to make sure that we foster opportunities for group work. Sayyidina Umar said, La Islam illa bil jama'a. Sayyidina Umar al Faruq radiallahu anhu, who the Prophet mentioned on numerous occasions, Wallahi, I love you. Who the Prophet asked, Make dua for me. Sayyidina Umar ibn Khattab, he said that there's no Islam without, we can phrase it in our language, community. And one of the things I've seen over the last week that's like super commendable, mashallah, is our MSA here at NYU and Tandon in every other university across the globe so nobody attacks me. <laughs> but I can specifically speak to the incredible performance of our students here on this campus in light of Charity Week. You know, I, I was an MSA president years ago, subhanAllah, and the difficulty of trying to keep people together, um, the meetings, you know, people are very young, which is not a bad thing, but when we're all the same age, even as we get older, we tend not to listen to one another because we see each other as peers. So what I've seen from our incredible group of MSA students is that investment in building community. Like their unity, imagine the MSA is made up of Sunnis and Shias, people from different ethnic backgrounds, people from different social economic realities, and they don't have any differences amongst themselves, subhanAllah. They kept Allah in front of them. They kept the Ummah in front of them. So mashallah, to see Sister Melanie, Sister Maha, all the bros, mashallah, doing what they're doing. Sister Aisha to the BMI, Black Muslim Initiative, people coming together for this week to make sure that people in Palestine have healthy eyes. To making sure that people across the globe have basic medical services. That is the beauty of this ummah. We are an ummah that if we don't work for Allah, Throughout history, we're plagued with division. But when we work for Allah, we can love for Allah. Because our purpose is Allah. وَأَنَّ إِلَىٰ رَبِّكَ الْمُنْتَحَىٰ So, I, I want to encourage everyone. I think tonight there's also a program with Imam Hassan Akbar, who's like, SubhanAllah, he's amazing, MashaAllah. I want to encourage everyone to support our Muslim students this week, inshaAllah. Uh, to donate generously to them, the work that they're doing in partnering with Islamic Relief, and just to let them know, speaking on my behalf, I'm sure the others were very proud of you, and honored to see this unity, subhanAllah, uh, amongst people who've come from very different trajectories. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to bless them, we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make this year of the work that they do for Allah, we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to increase them. And now I know this is one night I was out on a date with my wife, Dating's encouraged, you know? Keep dating after marriage, mashallah. And we were in Dumbo trying to get some intelligence. And as we were walking, yeah, watch it. As we were walking, saw a group of young Muslims. It was the MSA here from NYU. And I asked him, like, Sister Maha. Suraya, mashallah, what's going on? Sister Mayama, they're like, we're here to build our unity. Like, we're here deliberately investing in our love for another. That's beautiful, man. And we hope that that future will happen with the Muslim community. We invest in loving one another, making sure that people don't feel lonely, asking about people, checking in, supporting them, not ostracizing them when they screw up but bringing them closer to the forgiveness and transcendent love of Allah. So I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to bless them, encourage you all to support the great work they're doing. May Allah continue wahid safufahum insha'Allah. We ask Allah by all of his names and attributes to bless our brothers and sisters in Lebanon. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Lebanon is extremely strategic for a number of reasons, mashallah. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bring peace and tranquility. Ask Allah to protect the Kurds. 
and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protect them now. So many different international things are happening to this community of people who have a great history in our religion. Salahuddin Ayyubi was from the Akrat, Asla. His family came from the Kurds. Imam Ibn Taymiyyah, his family were Kurds. So many great personalities. And Imam Ibn Hajib al Maliki, the Akrat. Askalan yahmi him, inshallah, wa hafazahum. Pray that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will allow us to see the way the tides of nationalism. And the only thing that we can see is khayra ummatin ukhrijat li nas. We ask Allah to help us see our greater purpose as a community to heal a fractured world. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to bless us to be allies of those who are wrongly incarcerated in this country. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to protect us from spending money that may contribute explicitly or implicitly to military industrial complex, the prison industrial complex. We ask Allah to limit our pain that we cause in the world around us and to help us amplify our prophetic light. Ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to bless and help those who may be suffering with loneliness. You're not lonely because your iman is weak. Whoever said that is the most successfully ignorant human being that ever has walked the face of the earth. But loneliness can be for very real things. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless us to be there for you and to aid you. We pray for our new Muslim brothers and sisters. May Allah guide you and guide your friends and guide your parents, help you and assist you through the challenges and navigations of the convert excursion. Ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make the Qur'an our imam, the Prophet sallam, our example. Subhanahu rabbika rabbil izzati amma yasifun wa salamun ala al-mursaleen wa alhamdulillahi wa alhamdulillahi wa alhamdulillahi wa alhamdulillahi wa alhamdulillahi wa alhamdulillahi wa al